Oh, you don't know how lucky you are. You know, outside, they have thousands of people standing there trying to get in. Then we have three other rooms that are packed, just like this one. So you'd be very, very good real estate investors, this group. Amazing, really amazing. I want to thank you all. It's great to be here. We had some big news today, a lot of good news. First of all, you know, Hillary was right down the street. She had, listen to this, would you say, would you say we have 4,000 people at least tonight? At least. So we have two rooms like this full. We have at least, I guess, 2,000 people outside. And Hillary had 250 people. That's not good. That's not good. Well, I'll tell you what. I love the area. I love, I love Massachusetts. I love. Why do they always say that a Republican can't win Massachusetts? I think we can. You know why? I think the Democrats are so sick and tired of watching our country lose that they're going to vote for the Republican if this is the one. I really believe that. And we love, love, love New Hampshire. We love it. You know, so about 10 minutes ago, they just gave me some results. You know, somebody says, you really like polls. I said, yeah, I like them because I'm winning. You know, when you're not winning, you don't like them as much. But we're really winning. We're winning everything, everything, every state. We're winning everything. We're winning everything. So this just came in. Reuters, 33 for Trump. 33%. Remember, remember what that means. We have 15 people in addition to myself. We have 16. If you get 33, you know, somebody said, oh, I think he's peaked. I think he's peaked. They constantly say it. He's peaked. I hear this every week. You know, we go up, up, up. Oh, and if then we go down one point, it's like, it's like we're on the Titanic. Oh, it's unbelievable. Three weeks ago, we went down a point. It was like, oh, it's over. Then we went up two points, they don't report that. Then we went up five points. So here it just comes out, look at this. Reuters, good Reuters, good, right? Professional, good? Oh, Jeremy, I wish you'd tell the truth. CNN, CNN. All right, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? You know, I told him last time, it was very interesting. We were at such a great success. It was so great. You saw it three nights ago. We had, 8,000 people, maybe? There were eight demonstrators. No, no, it was true. You saw it the other night. Eight demonstrators. And they started, you know, shouting a little bit, and they were gone very quickly. And they were, you know, it's freedom of speech, you can do it. And I said to the people, 8,000 people, and I said, here's the bad part, there'll be the story. And I thought I could talk the press out of it by saying that. Next day, demonstrations, are I'm telling you, we had eight people. <laughs> and two of them asked for my autograph when I was going out. No, it's true. These were not violent demonstrators. These were nice people. But anyway, so Reuters comes out with 33. Carson's at 15 in second place. Think of it. That's a big difference. That's a big difference. Then you have other people. Actually, Carly is way down. Wow, what, what went on? What's going on? She went way down. But you have Rubio is way lower, way lower. But if he goes up two points, Rubio surges. No, I had it in Florida. You know, we're winning Florida. Can you believe? I love Florida. So we're winning Florida. And they had a poll. And I was 29. And they were your governor and your sitting senator. They were like 11 and 14 or 15. And one of them went up a little bit. And they talked about Bush and Rubio headline, doing better. And I said, oh, that's too bad. I guess I got wiped out. I must be way down. So I'm reading the story. I get to paragraph three. And I'll say, why Mr. Trump is at 29? I say, wait a minute, I'm at 29. They're at 11 and something. But that's the dishonesty of the press. You have no idea how dishonest these people are. You have no idea. No, you have no idea. It's brutal. It's brutal. You get sort of tired of it. Actually, it's so bad. It's so bad. Last night, I watched Megyn Kelly. I haven't watched her in a long time. And you had these two clowns on, one Steyerwalt and another one. The other one, who was a speechwriter for George Bush. How can you be a speechwriter for George Bush? I mean, I like George Bush. He's a nice man, but I don't necessarily want to write speeches for him. So he's saying, and he actually said something to the effect that, yeah, Carson's tied or winning on all the... And it's not even close. 
and you can't do anything except one thing I can do. Actually said that Carson, who's a nice guy, by the way, he's a nice guy, he really is. But they actually said that Carson is tied or winning in all the polls. And I'm saying, and you know, on my Twitter, I had people that went crazy. That it's a total lie, Mr. Trump. It's a to they want to have like a revolution. And it is a total lie. But they have these two puppets that work for her, and they say these things, and it's incredible. So here's the polls. In New Jersey, now remember, Reuters is national. 33, second place is 15, right? Here's the state of New Jersey. Great place. I love New Jersey. Got some problems, to be honest. It's got some problems. Trump, 32. Second place, 13. Okay? Then I hear that, like, I'm tied. I'm not tied. We're killing everybody. Actually, no, it's true. It's true. It's true. Peggy Noonan has been great. I think she's fantastic. She's a great writer. And that's only because for the last three weeks she's written great. But tomorrow she writes a story, which I saw tonight, and she talks about that we're sort of leveled out. And I figured, oh, that's a terrible story for me. Can you imagine being leveled out? It's a bad story. And you know what leveled out means? It means that I haven't gone up as much as the last couple of weeks. But, you know, it's hard to go up when you're at 32, 33, 35. And then inside the story, she said he had a great week with the polls. And I say, how can I say leveled out? Maybe it was a bad guy who wrote the headline. And I said, well, wait, how are we leveled out? Then they talked about Nevada, where I'm up at 38% and win the Hispanics. You believe it? And Peggy, and remember, I like her a lot. I think she's great. And then she said, great week. But the title was not so good. And then, so Nevada, she said, great week. So I'm at 38. Then in South Carolina, I'm at 36, right? And then in Connecticut, which just came out, that's Quinnipiac. Great pollster. I'm at 34 to 14. And she puts these in. And I'm saying, how did I level out? It's the press. And then, oh, and then a Romney person. And, and you know what? We all like Romney, right? But he should have won. Give me a break. I supported him. I supported McCain. I supported these people. And this time I said, you know what? You ever have it like you're with your wife, you're with your husband, and you're really competent, and you're tired of seeing things done wrong, and you just say, you know, this time I'm going to just do it myself. Does that make you understand that? I mean, we should have won that last election. We should have won. But, you know, he doesn't like me too much. I backed him and everything else. But I was so upset that he lost an election that should have been won. So they have Romney's guy going around, his, his manager going around. He's selling a book. The guy's incompetent. He's talking about this. Thing. Then you have somebody else. You have his pollster or a person does. And he's the one that gave them the idea. He said, I think he's flattened out. And because of that, I end up with a headline, even though they're copying all the other polls. So listen. So you have 33 to 15 national. You got 32 to 13. You got 38 to like 11 in Nevada. But it's sort of amazing, isn't it? But you know what's so important right here? They go over the different categories. How does he win? Now, this one's Nevada, but it was also the same thing, pretty much the same numbers. It was really amazing numbers. Same numbers in South Carolina, done by CNN a couple of days ago. In fact, somebody at CNN called and said, your numbers are unbelievable. And I said, I agree. I can't believe it. <laughs> so they have, they have who is going to be your first choice? Who's going to win for president? Trump, 38%. Pretty good. Then they have one that's slightly important. It's called, who's going to be best for the economy? You agree? That's important. We, want to, we have to get all these young people, we have to get them working, right? Like him, like him, like her. We got to get them working, right? Got to have jobs when they're ready. So on the economy, listen to this one. Trump is 67. When I say 67, I mean 67%. That's big. How do you have 67% when you have 16 people, right? You know, 67% would be amazing if you had me and somebody else. Do you agree with that? That's called a landslide. There's no such thing. It's true. But how do you have 67%, 67 out of 100? How do you have 67% when you have 16 people running? It's very hard. I mean, you've got to be good. In fact, it's great for my ego, I will tell you. It's economy. <laughs> Remember the expression, it's the economy, stupid? Well, then the election's over. They all say how important. Well, nothing more important. I mean, look, defense is more important to me. Defense is right. And I do great on defense. Wow. Hey, look at that. Speaking of defense, just came out. Foreign policy, 34 Trump. Wow. The next one is 13, 12, and 11. 
And there are senators. These are senators. You know, they don't show up to vote. They don't show up. They have this horrible attendance record. They drink too much water. You know, it's ridiculous. <laughs> then you have, so think of that, 34% on foreign policy. That's a good number considering all these people. Then on ISIS, Trump, who's the best? On ISIS. Because I'll tell you what, I'll be great on the economy. I'm going to produce jobs. I'm going to take jobs away from China. And I'm going to take them away from all these places. And we're going to take them. And you know, I get along great with China. And I say it all the time, their leaders are too smart for our leaders. We do not have smart leaders, folks. And I get along great with Mexico. But you know what Mexico has done to New England? I mean, how many people, how many people have lost their jobs with companies that moved down for no reason whatsoever to Mexico? And it's getting worse. Ford is moving there now. Big plant, massive, two and a half billion dollar plant. Nabisco is leaving Chicago. They're moving. And we don't do anything. A great factory is taken out of Tennessee, and they're going to Mexico. It's supposed to go into Tennessee, it's going to Mexico. I mean, are we stupid? Why are we doing this? What's the purpose of it? We're destroying our country from within. It's true. It's true. So I'm going to be great on jobs, I'm going to be great on the economy, but I think one of the big sleepers is going to be me on foreign policy, me on, frankly, me on the military, and me on the vets. The vets. Because... Our vets are being treated like third-class citizens, and it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. It's not ever going to happen with me. We're coming out with a plan very soon. And by the way, just in terms of plan, just in terms of plan, the vets, as of one month ago on Wednesday, had the longest wait in the history of the VA. People are waiting three, four, five days to see a doctor. And then sometimes the doctor is not even the right one, or he's not there, or he goes away for the weekend. Wait, can you imagine if I went into a doctor's office and I had to wait? I would go wild. I'd go wild. But think of it. And sometimes it's as simple as a pill or a small, you know, a small procedure to take care. And without it, you can die. And with it, it's so simple. Like a bacterial infection or something where you can get rid of it right away and people are living their lives with this stuff. They can't think of it. They can't get in. This is what's happening. And we're going to work it because I am so tired of the Veterans Administration and the incompetence. And you people, you have a lot of vets in New Hampshire, a lot of vets in Massachusetts, and I see all these heads, they're all nodding and they're agreeing. But if they can't get in, we're gonna let them go see private doctors, private hospitals, get themselves fixed up, and we're gonna pay the bill. It's simple, it's simple, it's simple. And you know what? I would be willing to bet that's cheaper. You know, thousands and thousands of people have died waiting because they can't get care. And seriously, at some of it's really minimal care. It's stuff that would never cause a problem. And they die. And they're vets. And yet, illegal immigration gets treated better. You heard the other night, this maniac, Sanders. And then Hillary keeps going, yes, yes, I'll do that too. Yes, yes. They want to raise your taxes to 90%. 90%. If you work, they'll think of it. You know, they call them. Somebody said, well, that's a little rough. Because, you know, I called them a word. Did anyone know the word? Right? That's uh, true. Communists. Oh. Well, you know, what he wants to do is unthinkable. He wants to raise costs by trillions of dollars. And you know who's going to pay for it? You're going to pay for it, just so you understand. I mean, you know, it's not like, oh, gee, we'll do it and everything's going to just evaporate in the air. It's going to evaporate. Free. <laughs> he talks about free. <laughs> and you know what? Where it's necessary, you do what's proper. We want great medical care. We want things. But what's happening here with this... Bernie, and the problem is he's dragging Hillary. Poor Hillary. Oh. She's, you know, he's ranting and raving, and she's saying, I'm going to do that too. I'm going to do that. How about free medical care for illegal immigrants? No, no, but how about it? But our vets don't get it. Our vets aren't getting it. And they have better treatment. Somebody even said they want to put the illegal immigrants on Social Security. So... Not going to happen, folks, because I will tell you, I will tell you, we're going to build a wall. It's going to be a real wall. We're going to build a wall. And you know what? We're going to have a beautiful big door in that wall, but we're going to have people come in. And they're going to come in, but they're going to come in legally. They're going to come in legally. They're going to come in legally. And they're going to be great. And the ones that are here that are bad, because we got some bad apples. We got gang members all over Los Angeles. They're illegal immigrants. These are illegals. They're illegals. 
You see what happened to Kate in San Francisco. And I took heat when I first announced, how about me? Rush Limbaugh said, man, he's taken more incoming than any human being I've ever seen. And then they found out I was right. I talked about crime. I love Mexico, by the way. I love the Mexican people. I have thousands working for me, thousands. I have thousands. They work for me, and they're great. They're great. But we have people here that shouldn't be here. We have people that should be back in their countries and let their countries take care of them. Let their countries take care of them. You know, I heard one of the other candidates say, we're going to put them in prison. Well, what are we going to do? Put them in prison for 45 years? We're going to take care of them? I don't think so. I don't think so. But you look at some of these gangs, you look at some of these members, these are tough dudes. I just saw the police over here. Where are these? Look at these guys. These are beautiful. Come here, come here, come here, come here. Come here, fellas, come here. Nobody's going to mess with these guys, that I can tell you. Nobody. Nobody. But the big thing is we have to let them do their job. They do an unbelievable job. We have to let them do it, but nobody's messing. All right, get the hell out of here, fellas. <laughs> these guys are great. They do such an amazing job. So we go down the line, and I say to myself, we don't have victories anymore. We don't. Whether it's ISIS, I watched a general the other day on television being interviewed. First of all, why does a general get interviewed? Who ever heard of a general being interviewed, right? Only in this administration. The general, they said to him, what do you think of ISIS? Oh, it's very tough. <laughs> tough. ISIS is tough. Can you imagine General George Patton saying, gee, ISIS is really tough? <laughs> First of all, he wouldn't be on television talking. You know what he'd be doing? He'd be doing the shooting, not the talking, right? It wouldn't be talk. He'll talk. He'll talk. You know what he'll talk? In the parade when he's coming up Fifth Avenue and everybody's celebrating him. That's what he's going to talk. General, how about General MacArthur? Highest marks in the history of West Point. These guys, these were generals. We need a general. We need a general. They had the whole deal. Tough, smart. They even looked good. I know it's not nice to say. They'll say, oh, that's not nice. That's not politically correct. When these guys got out of their plane, they looked like, okay, that's my, like these guys. We need strength back in this country. So I'm watching, I'm watching this general, and they said, well, how long would it take to beat ISIS? Oh, I don't know. They're very, it's very tough. And I'm saying, what's wrong? Then another general who's retiring, good guy. They're all good guys. But he said the Army is the least prepared that he's ever seen the army in the history of the country. Now, he may have said since Second World War, but I think he said in history. But he said the worst he's ever seen. Now, he's retiring. Good guy. I don't want to mention names. Good guy. But how about this? We spent all this money. We owe $19 trillion. Used to be 18. Every two months, I change. I go from 18. Let's see. I said 18 last month. Now it's 19. Now it's going to be 20 very soon. So we owe $19 trillion. We spend all of this money. We're getting ripped off by China, by Japan, the cars they pour in, by everybody. We get ripped off by every country. Brazil, name a country. Anybody know a country? Where are you from? I'll show you, your country is beating us. Where are you from? Okay, name a country, it doesn't make any difference. Germany, yeah, we protect Germany. How about Germany, okay? We have a, an economic behemoth. Did you know, you know, most people don't know, you know we protect. Germany. You ever hear our budget for military is many, many times every other country? And that sounds good. You know why? Because we're protecting everybody. It's not for us. South Korea, I told you, I order televisions all the time, South Korea. I have big projects. 4,000 televisions, fairly recently. 4,000. I want to buy it. I'd love to buy America. I don't even try because nobody makes them. So it's all, everyone, South Korea, Samsung, LG, they all come in with bids. Actually, Japan, you know, Sony, but they so lo they've lost their way, Sony. I got to tell you, their prices are so high, it's ridiculous. <laughs> but South Korea, 4,000 televisions. Now, we protect them. We have 28,000 soldiers on the border, and we have this maniac next door who's playing around with nuclear weapons. And we always talk about Iran, which, by the way, is the worst deal I've ever seen negotiated in history. The worst. The worst. It's the worst deal. 
This was done by incompetent people that, I don't know, maybe they don't care. How could you be so stupid? How could you do a deal, and I, I really mean this, where the Ayatollah and everybody else, or as the president calls him, the supreme leader. Do you ever notice? I refuse to call him the supreme leader. I'm not, you, if I win, I promise. I will never be talking about him as the Supreme Leader. I'll be saying, yeah, he's the head guy. I'll call him the head guy. But I'm not calling him the Supreme Leader. I watch Obama, the Supreme Leader, has said, well, the Supreme Leader wants to bring death to the United States, death to Israel, without question. They're dancing in the streets, and they're calling us stupid. They're saying we're stupid, okay? He says, we are. I guess we are. We're as good as our leaders, right? We're getting killed. But they call us stupid. Now, if you're doing, because you have a lot of very successful people here, if you do a deal and the person on the other side of the table walks out the room, you hear him call you a stupid jerk. What a stupid person. What a dumb, dumb person. Even if you think you're making a good deal, you're not making it anymore, right? Don't you think? I mean, it's incredible. So we have a case with Iran. Nobody mentions North Korea. I don't know what's wrong. So he actually has nuclear weapons. I think they don't want to bring it up. You know? No, I think they don't want to bring it up. And China has total control. Believe me, China, they, don't, they die without China. But China's too smart. You know, they're taking our money. They're taking our jobs. They're taking everything. And then we say, could you help us with North Korea, please? Please, please help us. And you know what China says? Oh, we'd love to, but we don't have much power over them. No, what we do is give them the food, the this, the that. Without them, they'd choke. They say, and by the way, I've read a lot, so much. It's coming out of my ears. Think of that. I read so much about this. China has total control. But they say they don't because they don't want to do it. They love us dangling. So we're after Iran, and it's a horrible deal, 24-day. How about the self-policing, where they police themselves? Do you like that? How about the four prisoners that we don't get back? OK? How about? And now the other day, they said, we'll give you three back, but we want 19, and we want many other things. Oh, this is us. Sergeant Bergdahl. Right? No, no, think of this guy. In the old days, he gets shot for treason, right? Right? These guys would say it. They're, not, they're too nice, but they know. Believe me, they know. But Sergeant Bergdahl. So we have Bergdahl. So we get Bergdahl. This is the way we trade. This is like emblematic of everything we do. We get Bergdahl, a rotten trader, who should be, frankly, who negotiated with terrorists, who left, who six people died looking for him, who, by the way, the other night, on every television, they said he won't even go to prison. Because, no, think of it. Did you hear this? Because, well, he might have psychological problems. He's not feeling so good. Can you believe it? So we get Bergdahl, and they get five of the people that they most want, total killers, leaders, who are now back fighting, trying to kill everybody in their path. That's what they get. They get the five people they most wanted, and we get one traitor. I tell you what, probably can't do it. But if I win, I may just have him flown back right in the middle of that place and drop, <laughs> boom, right in the middle. Let him have him. Let him have him. I mean, that's cheaper than a bullet. But this is the problem that we have as a country. We don't have strength anymore. We don't have leaders anymore. You go to, you go to stores, and you don't say Merry Christmas anymore. No more Merry Christmas. No, no, think of it. No more Merry Christmas. You don't have any indication of Christianity. You're not allowed to do that. Oh, that's against the law. That's a, how, how sad is that? And by the way, if you're another religion, I think that's great too. I think it's great. Let them have their representative whatever. But if you, I think that's great. But why is it that we can't say Merry Christmas? You go into Macy's, which what's true, right? Merry Christmas. So sad. And it's not the same. I don't want to say happy holiday. Oh, happy holiday. Wonderful. And use your own expression. And I have friends that are in other religions. I mean, they're, they're, but they still like Christmas. Everybody has a good time with Christmas. It's true. It's true. And many of them, by the way, Merry Christmas. And many of them, actually, it's not in their religion. They celebrate Christmas. They love it. They love turkey. And they love everything. Our country's going to hell. I wrote a book. It's coming out. It's a horrible name, horrible picture. It's not a politically correct name, but I don't care. I don't care. You know, I said to somebody this morning, they were talking about political correctness. And I said, the problem is, it takes a long time. You know, I went to Ivy League school. 
I went to, you know, like, I'm smart. My uncle was up here. You know, my uncle was a professor at MIT. Does anyone know that? Huh? Dr. John Trump. He was a professor in engineering and a, like a really smart guy, Dr. John Trump. I mean, I mean, you know, it's okay to say Secretariat had fast horses, although Secretariat didn't actually do as well as we thought with that, but you know what I mean. But smart people. But who would think that these things are happening? Who would allow what's happening to our country to happen? And we're going to stop it. So I have this book, and it's called Crippled America, because that's what it is. It's crippled America. We've got 100 million people that are in the workforce that can't get jobs. And if they get jobs, they're working part-time jobs because Obamacare forces it, and other reasons, and the country's doing lousy, okay? And then you hear 5.2%, 5.3% unemployment. It's a total politician statistic because they don't want to say that there are 22 or 23%. I had one professor, one man, two weeks ago, he said we're at 42%. Now, if you think, if you take the 100 million and you start there, that, I guess you're around the 40s. But I don't even want to say that. Let's say we're 20%. But we are in trouble. And we don't know it. And we don't want to say it. So when they say 5.3% unemployment, that's politically correct. Everybody, oh, we're doing great. Then you go see your neighbor. Nobody can get a job. The kids, these beautiful kids that I see in the front, they go to high school. They go to college. They borrow money. And they come out. They can't get a job. They were good students, good schools. They can't get a job. And then you hear all about how well we're doing. We're doing terribly. But we're going to straighten it out. We're going to make it so good. We're going to make it so good. So the book comes out on November 3rd, and basically it talks about the problems and how to fix them. Because ultimately we want to fix them. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to be a critic. You know these critics, they talk about problems, that's it. We're going to talk about how to fix them. And it was interesting. It's Simon & Schuster, big company, great company. They came to me a few weeks ago. They said, we think it would be great. And a lot of people are after me. I did 60 Minutes, right? Was it good? Did you see it? And now I'm doing Saturday Night Live. That'll be great. That'll be great. And I'm doing a book, and I'm running for president, and I'm running a company. Other than that, I'm not that busy, actually. It's true. I'm thinking about it. Friends of mine say, boy, you're doing a lot. Well, I have children and executives that do a great job. The company I built up is a great company, and I have very, very good executives and great children that are doing a good job. But the book, Crippled America. So they've, Simon and Schuster sends this world-class photographer. Comes into my office. He takes these pictures that are so beautiful. I'm smiling. I never looked better. It was so good. I'm so happy. But there was one picture that was horrendous, horrible, angry, mean, like I'm really angry. And I said, you know, how can you have, when you're talking about the problems that the country has and how to fix them, now we can do it later when they're fixed, but how can I have a big smiling face? How can I do that? I have the worst picture of myself I've ever seen, and I agreed to it. My wife said, what are you doing? That is horrible. It's the meanest. I'm a it's true. It's, it's the worst thing. I'm looking. I, I think he got it when I wasn't, you know, I wasn't posing. He got me. And somebody said, maybe that would be a good picture. I said, there's no way. But I put that picture on. It's but I think the book is going to be good, and I think it's going to do well. And we're going to have some fun, and we'll see what happens. A few things. They talk about dreamers, right? Dreamers. They want the dreamers. Everybody wants to be a dreamer. But the dreamers don't refer to our children. They refer to other children coming into our country. And I want dreamers to be about our children. I want that. I want that. It's, it's so important to me. I want that. We're going to repeal and replace Obamacare. We are going to come up with a plan that's so good. Now, a lot of you are getting absolutely killed with Obamacare. Your premiums are up 45, 50, 55 percent. It's starting out to be a disaster. You see where it's getting smaller? People are opting out. Businesses are dying. They're hiring all part-timers so they don't have to show the number that you're supposed to show. I mean, what's happening with this Obamacare is a disaster. Your deductibles are through the roof. I mean, literally, you have to get hit with a tractor. You have to get hit with a tractor. And we are going to repeal it. We're going to replace it. We're going to get rid of the artificial lines that are drawn around each state. You know, the states, I get a bid. I have thousands of people. I bid. And if I'm in New York, if I'm in Massachusetts, if I'm in New Hampshire, I get no competition. Because the insurance companies, what you don't know is the insurance companies have really taken good care of Obama and the administration. They are making a fortune off Obamacare. A fortune. They've never done better. They've never done better. And you see, what they've done is they've drawn lines. We should have lines so strong at the border. Okay, believe me. Believe me. 
They've drawn lines around the states so you don't get competition. Now, if you're the head of an insurance company, I'd rather have all of Massachusetts or all of New Hampshire or all of New York to myself than have the whole United States where I'm bidding against all these other companies, right? And that's what's happened. And it's a disaster. And what we're going to do is we are going to have an unbelievable plan that's going to, where well, you actually can have your doctor. How many times can a person lie about something? 28 times. You can have your plan, you can have your doctor. Always you can have your doctor, you can have your doctor. Then people say, where's my doctor? Oh, forget it, he's gone. Now, a lot of doctors have left the practice. They're retiring. Because I have a few of them that are friends. They said they have more accountants than they have nurses. It's so complicated. They don't get their money. It's a disaster. It's a disaster. And remember, remember the website? Five billion dollars for a website that still doesn't work. It still doesn't work. So we're going to take Obamacare and we're going to make the insurance companies make much less money, but they'll do fine. They're making a fortune now. They'll do fine. And you're going to have competition and you're going to end up with great plans and you're going to bid it out and you're going to be happy. And everyone's going to be happy. And it's not going to cost the government because the one thing I want from the government, I want to make sure these entities and these companies are very strong. So if there is a catastrophic event, the insurance company is going to be able to pay for it. Not that we have some guy opens up a company and starts taking deposits and he can't pay it. So we've got to make sure they're strong. But that's all. That's all we need. That's all we need. And it's going to be beautiful. And everyone's going to be happy. And I'm going to get people to approve it because that's what I do. I get people to approve things. Right now, <laughs> right now you don't have that. You have a president that cannot get people to approve anything, so he keeps signing executive orders. He signs executive orders on the border. Come on in, folks. Come on in. As many as you want. People, thousands. You know, our Border Patrol people, I was there a few weeks ago. And our Border Patrol people are great people, but they're told, stand down. Somebody walks in front, stand down. People are walking like, incredible. The anchor babies. I always heard, oh, if you're born in the country. And this isn't Mexico. It's Mexico and every place else. China, all over Asia. People are being born on our soil. And congratulations, folks. We're now taking care of them for 85 years. So everyone said, oh, you can't do that. You can't say that. That's it. If you're born in this country, I said, wait a minute. We can't be so stupid that this is possible. People are having babies. They come across the border two days before they have the baby. They have the baby, and now congratulations. They're an American citizen. They get all the benefits. It's hundreds of thousands a year from all over the world, in all fairness. In all fairness to the southern border, from all over the world. So I looked into it, 14th Amendment. And guess what? Everybody said, even the television lawyers, they all said, well, you'd have to go through a whole big thing. It would take years. You have to go through it. I mean, it would, you'd never get it approved. Except there's a clause in there. There's a clause in the 14th that's there. And the worst that happens is you have to get a simple act of Congress. You don't have to go through the whole big deal that it was going to be impossible. And it was there. And everybody agrees with Not everybody. But the real legal scholars agree with me. Very simple. It could be you don't even need the act of Congress. Because they came in illegally. How can somebody coming in illegally, lying down, having a baby, congratulations, citizen? No, no, how does it, how can it be so, how can it work? How can it work? And then I, I used the term anchor baby and, and I was hit at a press conference. Mr. Trump, you know that's a derogatory term. I said, I said, well, I didn't know that. I mean, it's a term I've heard. What would you do? Well, the... Or just terrible term, Mr. Trump. Oh, good. Give me the term. Did you hear this? I mean, this was all over the world. It's the baby terrible term, Mr. Trump. Oh, good. Give me the term. Did you hear this? I mean, this was all over the world. It's the baby of an undocumented immigrant who happened to come into the country and sit down and have a baby. <laughs> After the seventh word, I said, no, that doesn't work. I'm sorry. I mean, it was amazing. It was all over the world. This reporter was saying, you know, baby of an undocumented. It went on and on and on. And, okay. But... It doesn't work. I mean, it doesn't work. It's not working for our country, but it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. Hundreds of thousands of people a year. And I have the biggest heart. I do have a huge heart, believe me, but we have to start thinking about ourselves. We have to start thinking about our country. I have to start thinking about our country. Our country is falling apart. Our infrastructure, our roads, our airports. I leave Qatar. I leave all of the different places. I leave all of them. I know all of them. You have airports like the likes of which you wouldn't even understand. Me neither. You leave some of these places, places in China. They have airports that are so incredible. And then we land at LaGuardia. 
where you have potholes in the runway. No, I mean, it's unbelievable. Where the runways are too short. Planes go in all the time, you know. And you know why? You have this filthy water. Filthy. They've been trying to expand the runway. It's not even nothing in the way except water. And they can't get the environmental impact statements. They'd rather save a tadpole. It's true. Oh, it's true. Then add another 1,000 feet to the runway so planes don't go in, because 7,000 feet now is too short. This is where we are. This is where we are. And it's going to change. It's going to change. A friend of mine is an excavator. And I tell the story because it's, that's the way it is. And he's very depressed. I said, why? Big excavator, big, big, big foundations all over the place. And he buys a lot of equipment. And he comes to me a couple of months ago. I've told the story, but it just is very emblematic. And he said, you know, Donald, I'm really disappointed because I always bought Caterpillar equipment, cats. But this time I bought Komatsu. Now, I know Komatsu. It's fine. It's not as good, by the way. It's not as good, but it's fine. He said, I've always bought Caterpillars. I bought Camacho. And he buys big orders. He's a very big contractor. And he said, I hated to do it. But they've so manipulated their currency, and they gave me such an unbelievable deal that I had to buy Komatsu as opposed to Caterpillar. And you see what's happening with Caterpillar. And you see what's going on. And he felt very badly. But he said, I owed it to my family. I owed it to my employees. I owed it to myself and the company to make a great deal. He said, they can't compete. And it's because of what they do with their currency. You know, Japan has a very strong leader now, Abi. And we have representatives, Carolyn Kennedy, okay? She's very nice. Oh, we're in Massachusetts. And you know that story. I tell that story. She wanted a job. She went to the White House. She said, I'd love to, I'd love to work for the administration. A couple of years ago, they said, oh, what would you like to do? I don't know. They said, would you like to be the ambassador to Japan? This was on 60 Minutes. I was, uh, did everyone like my performance on 60 Minutes? Amazing. It was great. You know who? Okay. And who was I on with? My stable mate, Putin. Trump and Putin. Oh, did I take heat? But he's fine. I, I'll bet I could get along with him great. I'll bet you wouldn't have these problems. I'll bet you I would get along with. A lot of people say, oh, Trump said he'd get along. Wouldn't that be better than what we're doing now? Wouldn't that be better? And honestly, if he wants to bomb the hell out of ISIS, I'm okay with it. It's not going to bother me too much. It really won't. It really won't instead of us being in another quagmire for the next 25 years. But it was interesting. So Carolyn Kennedy, they said, would you like to be ambassador to Japan? She goes, really? You have to see it. If you check 60 Minutes, this is what I'm saying. And she's a very nice person, I think. My daughter likes her, Ivanka. So I like anybody that Ivanka likes, I like. Okay, it's one of those. But she said, really? Now I see her wheeling and dealing, meaning she's being feted. She's being all over there, whining and dining her. And, you know, what? I mean, they are just ripping us. I want a Wall Street guy who's so vicious and so smart and so cunning, so cunning. I mean, I know guys that are brilliant, but they're brutal. You will not want to have dinner with them. You would not like them. You won't. Who cares? We're so tired of these people now that are just killing us. I know people that are so smart. You leave them with Japan. Don't worry about Abi. My guys, they won't be, they won't be having much dinner, believe me. And if they do, they're going to pay for it. We're not paying for it. I'll tell you. No, no, they're good because they're, they're natural. They're natural. It's like, it's like a great golfer. It's like Jack Nicklaus. You know, why did he make the putts? It's like Tom Brady. Great, right? Why is he better? Who the hell knows why he's better? He's a great guy. Who knows why he's better? Who knows? He just plays better. And they play better under pressure. You know, the great ones, you look at the great ones in sports. And the great thing about sports, it's a microcosm of life, but it's easier to understand. But you look at the great ones, they do better under pressure, whereas most people wilt. Right? We see it all the time. They wilt, wilt, wilt. I know the best. These guys are the best. And some are nice. Look at about 2% of them. I don't care. I have Carl Icahn, great businessman. He wants to do a lot. I have so many people. Ever since I went to number one of the I have the biggest guys and the best guys. Now, I know guys that aren't as big, and they're better. I know people that are totally overrated. I know people you never heard of. They're better than all of them. But we will have the greatest trading teams. Nobody's going to be losing $400 billion a year to China. Nobody. 
Nobody's going to be losing. We're going to have victories. And we're going to be liked. I've made great deals with China. I own the Bank of America building. Big chunk of it in San Francisco. Great building. Got it from China. I beat them. I mean, I just did a great deal. And it was, China was essentially on the other side. A little complicated because you went through 15 different routes. Complicated stuff. 1290 Avenue of the Americas, one of the biggest buildings in New York, biggest floor plates. And China. So many things I got from China. I have tenants in my building. The biggest bank in the world is from China. They're a tenant. So much. China's great, but they don't respect us. I go to dinner with the richest people in China. I mean, people that pay me a fortune for apartments. and I, They're friends of mine. They're great people. They say that they cannot believe what China is getting away with in this country. They tell me that. Now, that was before I announced I'm running. Now they say, I was only kidding. I was only kidding. <laughs> it's true. It's really true. But they can't believe it. So, if I win, we will go. I know. That always happens. I love you folks, but you got to say, if you know, I, I want to be the power of positive thinking. Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, great book, right? Dr. Norman Vincent Peale. But look, I'm running against a lot of people. Somebody said, oh, what a fine group. I'm trying to find out why. Why? Where? Who? Who? Bobby Jindal? I mean, you look at, that's Alfred E. Newman. Do you ever hear of Alfred E. Newman? Mad Magazine, Bobby Jindal. I swear, he looks just like him. It's true, think about that, right? Isn't that true? The guy's got zero. Pataki, he couldn't be elected dog catcher. He's got zero. <laughs> Lindsey Graham comes after me. He was a nice guy, then he comes after me. A month ago, goes from five to zero. So far, everybody that's come after me has gone down, right? Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. No. I mean, Lindsey Graham, I'm at 38, I think, in South Carolina. He's at three. He's a senator. His career's over. I really believe it's over. But why do they keep going? Think of it. They have no chance. They have zero. They have one. They have two. Why do they keep going? There's something I don't understand. If I was one of them, I would crawl quietly out. I'd probably tweet. I've decided to get out of the race. I wouldn't have a news conference. No, it's true. I'd tweet. I've decided I'm going to get out of the race. And then I'd sneak out to some place with my wife and I'd just go away. They have zero. Zero. And now they're going to go in the child stage. You know the child stage? They call it the children's stage. That's for the debate. It's an incredible thing. By the way, you saw what happened. So we're going to have a three-hour debate. And I give credit to CNBC, by the way. I give credit to them. Because they had guts and they did the right thing. But I said, wait a minute. We had a three-hour debate last time. By the time it was over, no, I could stand up for 20 hours. I could do it all night long. Standing here for two hours, this is a lot tougher. But I could stand up. All, but you know what? People sitting home, they don't want to watch three hours. Hillary, we were watching her for an hour and a half. And it was boring as hell. Who the hell wants to watch for three hours a debate? So uh, we actually called Ben Carson and myself. We wrote him a letter saying, listen, we're going to have it three hours. We're not going to participate. I want to have a good show. I want to have it be good. It's not about me. And I'm speaking for everybody, but they have no power because they have no polling, right? Yeah. I'm representing the politicians. Can you believe it? <laughs> and we won. Everyone said, you can't do that. You can't dictate. No. No. No, we won. Because you know what? It made sense to CNBC. And they're right. It'll do better. It'll be much better. But, you know, before I got involved, those debates used to do no business. Nobody cared about them. I'm not bragging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why not? Let's go. Before I got involved, they did nothing. Poorly rated shows. So then I got involved, and they figured, well, they'll probably have six, seven, eight million people. They had 24 million people in Fox. The biggest in the history of cable. And the number's actually higher now because, you know, they get the final numbers and they're higher. Then CNN goes on. They had almost 24 million. Listen to this one. The biggest number in the history of CNN. This isn't Donald Trump. You know, when they say, oh, Trump, I don't exaggerate. Believe me, I exaggerate a lot less than people think. They had the biggest rating in the history of CNN. And they took the price for ads from $4,000, you read this, to $200,000 and $250,000. So they made the debate so long. Who can blame them? But I give, my, I give a lot of credit to CNBC. They said, we have to do the right thing. And two hours is the right number. I mean, it's long. It used to be one hour. You know, when it started, it would be one hour. And they're going to do great. Everybody's happy. So that came out just a little while ago, so we're happy for that. Yeah, you know. Um, I just want to end by saying that it's so amazing. Wherever I go, we're having crowds 
like nobody's ever seen. I have a couple of folks that work for me, George and Corey and a lot of different people. And they've been doing this for a long time, many years. And I was asking him tonight, have you ever seen anything like this? I mean, you know, he's, uh, George has been doing How long, George? 25 years, right? 20, get up here, George. Get up here. Get up here. Corey, get up here, Corey. Get up here, Corey. These guys, they've been doing it for a long time. And I asked them the other day, because we had another one where you had 8,000 people. They couldn't get them in. Same thing all over. They go around with closed circuit televisions, because we have rooms. We have two other rooms going tonight and outside. Tell him, have you ever seen anything like this? And you better Never. say the right thing. Unbelievable. If he says the right thing, George, you're fired. Get out of here. <laughs> no, but he said before, he said, I've been doing this for a long time. I've never seen anything like it. And what we have is we have a movement. This isn't like a normal situation. I mean, honestly, Hillary down the road. And I said, you got to make sure. you got to make sure. Find out. What did the papers write? She just left. She had 250, right? I told you. 250 people. We have thousands. When I'm finished here, I'm going to two other rooms, and then I'm going outside. I'll never get out of here. No, it's true. It's true. And it's two other rooms this size. They're pretty big rooms. I actually said to my people, do you think you could find one really big room, please? But they can't. There is no place like that around here. So, yeah, we'll go to Gillette. We'll call Bob Kraft. Let's call Bob Kraft. Let's call. Good guy. And our coach. So you have Brady, you have Belichick, and you have Kraft. All good guys. Good guys. That's a good idea. Let's get Gillette. That's right. I would bet you, I would bet you we'd fill it. I would. You know, Mark Cuban called me. He owns the Dallas Mavericks. He said, you want to use our stadium, our big arena? This was on Thursday. I said, when? Monday. Four days. I said, Mark, how many does it hold? Like 20,000. I said, how are we going to fill it? He said, I think you'll do it, actually. So I said, all right, so it's maybe going to be embarrassing. You know, having 1,000 people in a 20,000-seat arena is not good. You can imagine what, what the press, what these guys would do to me if that happened. So I took a chance. The first day, we sold 16,000. The second day, it was gone. The fourth day, we went there, and we had an unbelievable. We had 20,000 people. We had 35,000 people in Alabama, Mobile, Alabama, great people. We had, in Oklahoma two weeks ago, we had 20,000 people in a park. And it was windy, so I wore a hat. But it is my hair, you know. We know. It. Very windy. I wore that red hat. But in, in Oklahoma, in Oklahoma, we had 20,000, and I think it was actually more than that, but we had 20,000 people. Up in New Hampshire, we're getting four, five, six thousand people. They never had, I mean, nobody's seen anything like it. And what I say, in Iowa, the crowds, the biggest crowds they've ever seen in Iowa. And it's true, and, and we're not even that close. You know, a lot of times when you get closer to the election, what's going to happen? when we get closer. But the biggest, most beautiful crowds, and what I'm saying and what I tell people is that, and people that work, that are professionals that do this for a living, you know, they're usually working, in all fairness, they're usually working for people that they go to a place and they have like four people show up at 25 or 80. But we have thousands. And this is a movement. This isn't just like, oh, let's go out. And, and you look at the enthusiasm and the spirit and the love in these rooms. And I told this story the other night. A friend of mine is a very rich guy, but he's not a public speaker. And he said to me, how do you do that? I said, honestly, when you go before some of these crowds, there is so much love and enthusiasm in the room. It's not even hard. It really isn't. I love doing it. And he said, how do you do that? But it's true. And, and what we have, what we have is we have a movement. This is not like a normal situation. People are tired, tired. They're sick and tired of being thrown around, of being mistreated by politicians who are controlled, by the way, totally controlled, by their donors, by their special interests. You know, I gave, uh, it's been amazing. I've spent much, you know, I'm way under budget on this campaign. How can I spend money? It's all Trump all the time on television. Can you imagine? It's all Trump and then I take commercials, right? So I thought we'd be at about 20 million by now. I haven't spent anything. And the only, I don't take any contributions other than if, People call in, you know, I think we had 75,000 contributions of 50, and by the way, you don't have to bother, but, but people are sending in money, and it's hard. They send them in to me, and we got, you know, money. Not, it's a lot of people, 80, 000, almost 80,000 people sent in. Women sent in $7.50, $25, $50, $200, all little contributions. And that's all I take, and, and the only reason I take it is you can't really send it back. 
for two reasons. Number one, can you imagine the bureaucracy? It would cost you more money to send it back than just to put it in a bank. Second of all, if a woman sends in $19 with a three-page letter, there's no way you can send it back because she will be insulted. Believe me, there is no letter you can draw. She will be so insulted, she'd lose her heart. These are real people. These are great people. And And they've still, as, as you know, when you hear 75 or 80,000 people do this, it's still like $3 million or something, $3, $4 million. Now, so I was going to have $20 million spent. I haven't spent. And then I said to myself, wait a minute. Should I put a lot of money in there just to show up? Or should I just sit back and wait? Should I say the following? I'm number one in every poll and I spent the least money. That's what we want in the country, right? Don't you think? You know, think of it. Think of it. Think of it. Wouldn't it be nice? I mean, some of these guys have spent $25 million and they, they don't even know what they're doing. And you know, I told my people I wouldn't do it, but I don't care. A lot of the money that you see raised, it's a whole big scam. Because when you say they raised 20 million, they raised 15 million, do you know what people take out of that money by the time they get to actually use it? They have very little left. They have very little left. You have guys taking commissions. I mean, you have the, the government ought to even look at it. It's better than renting apartments for brokers. You have guys, I mean, Romney had a couple of guys made a fortune from raising money. What is this? So we have an unbelievable group of people. We have a great group of talent. And I just said, I'm going to start talking about the fact that to be the most successful and to have the most successful campaign, and some people say they've never seen anything like it in the history of politics, and to have spent the least amount of money, that I feel so proud of that, you know? I feel so proud of it. I actually said the other day, I said, you know what I think I'm going to do? I'm going to put some millions in, just so it sits there. So they say, oh, well, he's put... And then I said, well, wait a minute, we have that. Or we can say, look how little we're spending and we're winning. That, is that even, to me, that's better. Because that's what I'd like for our country. I'd like to spend little and be number one, instead of being a jerk and spending a fortune and be number one, or number 10. Right? I mean, you know. Now, with that being said, I'll be spending a lot of money and all that. But, but you know, I thought it was so cool. I thought it was so cool. I thought it was so amazing. So look at everybody in the room because something great is happening. Something incredible and something beautiful is happening. Things are going on. Massachusetts, you're going to have people voting for me that never voted for a Republican before. Because I don't care about labels. I don't care. They want to see our policemen. They want to see our police treated with great respect. They want to see our military built up and made so strong that nobody's ever going to mess with us ever, 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 ever. They want to see our veterans taken care of. They want to see Obamacare killed. They want to see us have a border so we have a country. So we have what used to be called the silent majority. I don't call it that. I call it a very noisy majority because these people are angry and they're disgusted. I can only tell you this. The American dream will not be dead. I say all the time, the American dream is dead, but I'm going to make it bigger and better and stronger than ever before. I say it all the time. We're going we're gonna to make it great again. We're going to make it great again. And we're going to go through the primary. I think we're going to do great in Iowa. I think we're going to do fantastic in New Hampshire. In, in South Carolina, in Nevada, where we're doing phenomenally. The SEC, it's like a football game. And it's the same thing. I mean, it's, you got to win. And we got to win because I don't care for myself, and people don't understand this. I only care for the end game. The end game. Because I have a wonderful life. People say, they'll never do it. Why would he do that? Why would he do it? It's hard. It's work. I could be home. I could be relaxed. I mean, it's hard. But I know... For a fact, I've been very successful. I know how to do things. I know how to make money. We have to make our country rich again. Because we can't be greater than that rich. We have to bring back the money, bring back the jobs, bring back all of the things that we used to have. People that don't know what they're doing, incompetent people, have let it get away for years. We're going to bring it back. We're going to bring it back faster than people thought. Much faster. Much faster than people thought. It's not going to take so long. And I can promise you one thing. If I win, <laughs> thank you. 
But if I win, we got to, still got a lot of people out. We got to beat them. And I'm used to winning. I win. That's what I do is win. How about these characters that say, oh, oh, we think Trump maybe is getting, I just win a poll by 20 points. We think maybe he's going to get out of the red. Now, I'm not going anywhere, folks. Me, just so you understand. I told Meet the Press because I was being honest. Chuck Todd said to me, are there any conditions under which you'd leave the race? Now, a politician would say, absolutely not. These guys at zero say no. They're never going to leave. They're two days later, they leave, right? They lie. But there's no controversy that way. So I said, well, you know, if I started doing really badly, if I came here and there were no people, if the polls were terrible, if nobody cared about me in the press, instead of like going like they're maniacs where we get these crazy ratings and they do care about me, if it all fell apart, yeah, I'd get up the next day. Like, Trump might consider leaving. They're so dishonest, all of you. They are so, no, no, no. They are so dishonest. Horrible. And they never show. I do this all the time. They never show the room. 8,000 people. My wife, I come home. Oh, I thought you did great last night. Were there many people there? So what do you mean they had 8,000 people? Oh, they never showed the crowd. They have the camera on your face. They never show it. And they turn down the volume. So you have people going crazy, but they, you don't even hear. She said, were there many people? 8,000. 8,000 is like a small room for me. But they only show. I tell them to pan. Do you guys ever pan? Even now, pan. Go ahead, pan. Pan. Pan the room. They don't even pan when you tell them. They're bad people. They're bad people. But I won't say if for this, if this has been a great run, and this has been a great. So when I win, when I win, when I win, we are going to make America great again, better than ever before. Believe me. Thank you. I love you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. We love you.